Welcome, everybody. I was going to say to the first, what the fucking art of the year, but it's not the first, is it, Carla? No, it's not the first. It's not even, it's not even a year. Oh, no, it, this is a year. February. The first webinar in February. Now, we've got some very special guests today. One of them brushed their hair. Ian Meyer, would you like to say hello? Hello, yes. I usually don't brush my hair, but today I did. Special occasion. We should all feel very fortunate for that. Daniel's brushed his moustache. Hello, Daniel. Hello, everybody. Daniel from Engineer Better. Don't call it Engineering Better. He'll come and he'll come and he'll tweet you. He'll tell you off on Twitter. Put you in an arm lock or something. Put him in an arm lock. And of course, we have the wonderful Holly Cummins, our real guest of honor. Welcome back, Holly. Hi, yeah. Nice to see you. I won't make any comments about you brushing your hair. <laughs> I did brush my hair. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's good to know. And of course, we are joined by our regular. Uh, partners in crime, which are Teresa and Carla. Hello, ladies. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. They are, of course, the people behind these webinars, the ones who make them happen on time, that give us a platform to speak and look cool, and everybody else who comes to the webinars a chance to listen, uh, engage, and have fun. So welcome to everybody, and welcome to all of our guests today, and, of course, our, my colleagues from Container Solutions. We will be speaking about GitOps. What the fuck is GitOps? Right? I don't even know what the fuck a regulated industry is. So I'm definitely going to learn something. Right? I don't know what GitOps is and I don't know what regulated industries are. I should probably look it up. But that's what we're going to be speaking about. Why, why is GitOps cool? What does it do? And specifically, why does it work so well in regulated uh, industries? And of course, we've got some amazing speakers today, Ian, Daniel and Holly, all of whom have unique perspectives on this particular uh, subject matter. Before we jump into that, let's first do a little bit of um, housekeeping. We do have a code of conduct. The code of conduct roughly says be nice and respectful to each other. We do hold the, uh, we do uh, enforce the code of conduct. So any breaches in the code of conduct will lead to potential sanctions, such as you've been asked to leave the webinar and potentially you'll never be allowed to come back. If you would like to read the code of conduct in full, you can follow the link that Teresa is about to share in the chat box. If you want to take this code of conduct and use it for your own online or offline events, please feel free to do so. Uh, take it, change it as you as, uh, as you see fit. We do swear quite a bit on the, on, I mean, it is called what the fuck is GitOps. So we do swear quite a bit, but we're trying to tone it down or somehow find a middle ground. Very hard to do when Ian Miles in the house, right? Just, I'm just saying that, right? it's very difficult. Um, so please don't be offended by that. We do record the uh, webinar, and that is so that we can share it later on YouTube and on social media for those people who couldn't come and attend. If you have got a problem with recording, switch your camera off, or if for some reason you, you, you've got your camera on and you don't want to be in the recording, we might be able to do something with that. So just, but just be aware that we do record it, and if you're really not comfortable with that, then maybe you should drop out and then you can, you can actually watch the playback yourself. Um, and there's always one more housekeeping that I forget. Teresa, what am I forgetting? Today you have not forgotten anything. I did not forget anything. I that's, that's amazing. Well, I'll do one extra little piece of housekeeping. If you would like, oh no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's a slide about that, that later. I'll stick to the plan. Okay, announcements. Okay, what the fuck is the gossip? There is no gossip today. Um, I'm sorry, we didn't prepare, but we haven't changed the slide. Let's just do a few announcements and then I'm going to hand over to Ian and the team to discuss what GitOps is in, in regulated industries. Okay, so first of all, WTF is a newsletter, a, a, a bunch of essays, videos, potentially podcasts in the future, and real conferences. If you want to be updated about what we're doing, you can follow this link. We are not a spammy company. If you click you want to subscribe to the newsletter, you will only get the newsletter. If you click you want the newsletter and the webinars, then that's what you get. If you're interested in applying for a job at Container Solutions or being informed of upcoming jobs, you can tick the box that you're interested in job openings. If you want us to sell you something, you can tick the box that uh, says sell me something. But even then, we're not, very, we're not a very sales organization, so it's probably much more likely to be a chat. So if you want more information and you want to subscribe to WTF, you can follow those links or click, click. This does sound like an old person. You can follow the QR code on your, on your uh, telephone. We do have an awesome conference coming up. So for most of you who remember about this time last year, we had a webinar called What the Fuck is SRE with Nathan. And it was so popular and it hit so, so many high notes. We were like, let's build a conference on the back of this. So the events team, the miracle workers that are Teresa and Carla, 
quickly got together, threw together uh, What the Fuck is SRE, which was an amazingly successful <laughs> online event. And so therefore we're gonna do it again on the 22nd of April, 22nd, the 28th of April, 2022. If you've got loads of money and you work for a big company and you keep, you keep coming to consume our con content for free, you might want to think about sponsoring, right? However, for everybody else, it's a free event. You can come along, you can share it with your colleagues, you can consume as much content as, you can, as your, your mind can take, or, of course, you can watch all of the videos on playback after the conference is finished. We are hiring, we're hiring a little bit like crazy. This slide says we're hiring an engineering manager and cloud native engineers, but actually we are hiring design thinkers, a new VP of engineering. We, we, didn't, we didn't fire the old one. The role has grown so much that our CTO can simply no longer handle the workload. So we're gonna have a CTO and we're gonna have a head of engineering. This is a really cool position, but we're also looking for scrum masters, uh, potentially a few of the miscellaneous roles. You can follow the, uh, the link below to find out about those job offerings. Container Solutions is a pretty cool place to work. We are growing now. And growth is, it means awesome results and many, many headaches. But it's all worth it. So we're in that phase where we're just rocketing now. Customers seem to love us. We still seem to love each other. So if you want to jump into that journey with us and follow those links uh, and, and see if anything takes your fancy. Oh, oh, that's it. There was no slide. There was no tuss of as the Dutch would say. It's my moment to hand over to Ian. Am I handing over to you? Yes, if I can unmute myself. Yes. Hello. Uh, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to click through these slides for you? Uh, there's only two slides. So, yeah, that's fine. Well, in, that, in that case, I will be your willing servant. Would you like me to click now? Please. There we go. So um, thanks for coming. Uh, I'll be chairing this discussion about, about GitOps in, in regulated industries. Um, we've got, you can see there, there's a, a, a set of topics we might wanna cover, but I generally like during these uh, webinars for people to uh, ideally put in the chat why you're here, what, what you're particularly interested in, any context you have around GitOps, it's, it's really good to do that um, because then we can work it into the discussion and make it, make, make it more interactive. Um, I know there's a lot of people here, so we can't all chat at once, but um, on the chat chat, uh, we, can, we can actually know what, what you're particularly interested in, whether you're an expert on GitOps, whether you don't know it very well, whether you're trying to do it in your organization, uh, what, what your context is coming here will be really helpful because we don't want to be explaining the basics to people who know them um, and we don't want to be doing the opposite either. So it'd be great if you could put something in the chat um, to introduce yourself. And talking of introductions, um, let's go around the panel and uh, we can all explain who we are, how we got here, and particularly what our context is with respect to GitOps. Uh, Jamie, is you, you're, do you want to go first? Uh, I'm muted, I'm not muted. I can go first. Uh, so my name is Jamie Dobson. I, I'm the founder of Container Solutions, actually, and the current chief executive. And I divide my time between managing this place, specifically the culture, and of course, working with customers, usually on tricky problems. So when I said I don't, I don't know what regulated industries were earlier, that was a joke. Uh, I actually am quite busy in regulated industries, typically finance. And so that's why I'm interested in GitOps and what does it mean to our uh, customers. I also wrote a book called Cloud Native Transformation, which is basically how do you transform a whole organization? It doesn't sell. I get like a check for two euros every six months. It doesn't sell like Ian's book sells. And that's because his books are better than mine. But it is a little bit of a handbook for how to do these things. And, and it, it helps me remember my job because there's, uh, there's a lot of copy in there. So that's me. Jamie, uh, Holly, do you want to go next? Yes, yeah, so I'm Holly Cummins. I work for IBM. Um, I'm a consultant at IBM and, and really what I do is help clients take advantage of the cloud, which <laughs> is sometimes easier said than done. So we sort of, you know, we start using the cloud and then we hit a lot of problems and then particularly in the regulated industries like finance, then we sort of hit this roadblock where, oh, we'd like to do this, but we can't because we're regulated. Well, really? Are you sure? Maybe, maybe we can get over that. Maybe we can actually make it 
better. Thank you, Holly. Uh, DJ. Thank you, Ian. Um, so my name is Daniel Jones, or DJ to my friends and family. Um, I am the Managing Director of Engineer Better, uh, which is a boutique consultancy, that's a polite way of saying small, um, who specialise in continuous delivery and productivity for folks uh, kind of implemented through cloud platforms. Uh, over the years, we've worked with um, a lot of financial institutions. So if you've got a bank account in the UK, or you're embezzling illegal funds in a Swiss bank account, the chances are we've worked with your uh, with your bank we've also done stuff with um, insurance uh, firms and uh, investment firms as well so quite a lot of experience in uh, regulated industries and also uh, regulated environments that aren't necessarily industries so organizations uh, like the UK government thank you DJ um, so yeah I'll, I'll go last uh, uh, my name is Ian Mile I have worked with Container Solutions for a couple of years before that um, I worked for banks for five years uh, doing Kubernetes projects. Um, so there was a lot of GitOps involved in that before, before and after it was the term was coined. Uh, prior to that, I spent 15 years working for uh, backend systems in online gambling, which arguably is the same, same thing in a different form. Um, in terms of GitOps, I've worked on a lot of GitOps projects um, while at Container Solutions and before. Um, and I wrote a book during lockdown called, because uh, that's how I like to spend my time, called uh, GitOps What You Need to Know Now, um, which is available for free on our site. I think there'll probably be a link coming up on that. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much for those who've put comments in already. Uh, I see there's a couple that say completely new to GitOps, so I'm glad we won't be wasting our time uh, discussing that as our first topic. Um, so what is GitOps? Um, DJ, do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about this? I was hoping you'd go first, uh, to be <laughs> perfectly honest. So, uh, GitOps is a modern name for a set of practices that kind of combined didn't really have one term to describe them all, but they're all existing practices that kind of coalesced together um, with the advent of Kubernetes into one thing that you could point at and give a name to. And I think it was the folks at Weaveworks that really kind of uh, coined the term GitOps and really started promoting it. Um, the principle is that everything is done through version control. So the kind of user interface of developers is, is version control. You do a Git push and then the path to production is automated from there. One of the reasons that this becomes powerful is that you can use version control as an audit history. So that any change to your platform, um, to, to your software stack, to what microservices is deployed, goes through version control. So it can be audited, checked by everybody else. And there's another kind of technical element to this, and that is about declarative convergent technologies. So when you think about um, Kubernetes, uh, it is both declarative and convergent. You say what you want the world to look like, and Kubes does its efforts to make sure that the world gets to that state. You don't say, like in older technologies like Puppet and Chef, like do this, do that, do the other. You say, I would like the world to look like this, please. And Kubernetes dutifully obliges. It's not the only technology um, that works in a declarative and convergent form. So things like Terraform as well are good examples um, of that declarative convergent thing. And there have been others throughout history as well. So if you combine that declarative convergent nature of like, I'm just going to stick in Git what I want the world to look like, and then the tooling will make sure that it looks like that. Um, that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is what GitOps means. I'd be really interested in other people's opinions. Um, maybe Holly, um, correct me if I'm wrong or I've missed anything out there. No, I, th I think you're exactly right. I, th I think for me, the one of the, the sort of the challenges we see is that gap in the middle between I've got it in source control, I expect the world to look like this, and but actually, <laughs> did I get everything configured right all the way through or was you know the turtles all the way down did i miss a turtle and then somehow there's a gap between reality and git that i then need to go back and have a headache about yeah it, the thing i like about um GitOps is that so before we, we had GitOps, we had devops 
Um, and DevOps was a super vague term that no one really wanted to. It was like nailing Jenny <laughs> to the wall, uh, getting anything concrete out of it. And I was even a, a I asked for for to be to be renamed in my job as a as a DevOps manager, a DevOps lead or something. And I didn't really know what it was at the time, but it, it meant that I got more calls from recruiters, so I was happy. Um, yeah, that, uh, sorry, just to jump in there. There's, um, I think one of the things that you touch on there is, is nice about GitOps is it's a technical implementation. You know, there's a way of doing things and you can point at something and say, that is GitOps and that's not. DevOps, you know, is a culture. It's you write it, you run it, and that could take any number of implementations, whereas GitOps, there's some certain things that need to be in place, which makes it slightly uh, more tangible, I think. Yeah, you can definitely say, uh, you can definitely say that this conforms to the definition of GitOps. There is actually a formal semi-formal definition by Weave who, who coined the, the term. Um, and it, it, it boils down to basically what you said, uh, DJ, which is, you know, declarative, uh, I've got it written down here, declarative data definition of systems, audited change through source code. So virtually everything is code and then or automated application of changes to environments. Um, so that's the interest. That's one of the interesting things is that it's not, one of the things that confuses people who come new to GitOps and maybe coming to this today is, is, is they think there's nothing new about this. It's all old stuff. And JV, if you, if you can click forward in the presentation, um, as part of the ebook, I put together this di very opinionated diagram, which purports to uh, show the, the prehistory of uh, everything leading up to GitOps. And it goes right back to shell scripts at the top and make and the declarative side and CVS on the source control side and SVN, and then you've got Mercurial and you've got Git. Um, I'm sure many people uh, coming here will have opinions on that, that diagram. Uh, I refuse to change it. <laughs> it's it, it's a certified 100% correct by me and it's never going to be changed. Um, and uh, the most common one is why isn't Ansible on there? And I always say because Ansible introduced nothing new to the table. Um, but yeah, uh, there is nothing new about GitOps. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, oh, it's, there's nothing new about the constituent parts of GitOps. What it, what it is, is actually to bring together these constituent parts into a philosophy or a, um, don't know what the right word is, but, um, but it's actually defined as, you know, there are anti-patterns, which GitOps is definitely not. So the, the, the anti-pattern I like to mention most in this context is firewall management. So I think many of us may have worked in many places that do firewall management by Excel spreadsheet. Um, I don't know if that's a common pattern that you've seen, but it's certainly one that I've seen. And so you make a change request through ServiceNow, uh, and then three weeks later, when, when all the approvals are got, um, someone goes to an Excel spreadsheet, uh, changes a cell, uh, or adds a row or something, and then goes on to the router, and then types out some commands, and then uh, you hope that the Excel spreadsheet reflects the reality uh, and then ServiceNow ticket is closed and you may or may not want to have your firewall change done. It's unbelievable, um, isn't it, Ian, how many large modern companies move into the cloud still work in such a way. These come across, we come across stuff like this regularly, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's one of the kind of, uh, I mentioned in the sort of, uh, I was going to say raison d'etre, but I'm not sure whether I pronounce the French words properly or what they even mean. But the kind of purpose of being of engineer better was always to improve productivity. And when you see folks working in that way, like it's perfectly normal, which in itself, I guess, is a problem. You can achieve results like that, but it's so ineffective and inefficient. And there are much better ways of doing it that mean that you waste a lot uh, less time. And, you know, we think about 21st uh, century ways of doing things. By not utilizing these kind of approaches and technologies, we're introducing, we're allowing waste in our path to production. And there's so much, so many better ways of spending time than copying and pasting things from Excel spreadsheets and kind of running manual checks and, uh, and those sorts of things. Yes. Um, so, so uh, sorry, I was just chatting in the chat. Uh, that's why I'm slightly distracted. Uh, yeah, so let's let's move on to uh, what what's a regulated industry. I mean, uh, we all know what we mean by regulated industry, but I thought it would be good to to go into a bit more depth about 
what a regulated industry and why, why it brings up so many challenges for us. I don't know, Polly, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so in, in every industry, there's a, a, an organizational requirement to, to do the right thing and, and reduce risk. But in, in most industries, the, um, that tends to be concentrated in one team and they've got fairly aligned goals. Not, not completely aligned. We still have conflicts between IT and business and that kind of thing. But what we see in regulated industries is that there is a legal framework which has been set out to try and reduce risk. And because there's this legal framework, that means that there's a team, the, the risk and compliance team, whose job it is to make sure that we don't break those rules. And I think that's where we start to see the, the sort of problems um, or the, the challenges. Be because there's this legal requirement and because there's somebody whose job it is to make sure that that law is not broken, they get a little bit separated from the incentives in the rest of the team. And so then you get quite a lot of tension between the teams and the rest of the team are sort of trying to do whatever the business is doing of, you know, let's let's deliver user value, let's let's make money, let's whatever it is. And then the risk team is sort of set up as this roadblock and their job description is make sure nothing bad happens. And so then because it's it's so disconnected and because they're not really accountable for the outcome of let's make sure nothing bad happens, we sort of see across the whole organization this drop in productivity and this increase in inefficiency and this sort of compliance theater, I think, is, is often what we see where we haven't actually reduced the risk but we can claim that we've reduced the risk and that's all that's needed. Yeah, thanks Holly. Yeah, you touch on a, a lot of trigger points for me where having worked in banking, uh, certainly the, th the theater element of it. Um, DJ, have you worked in any other industries you'd regard as, I mean, banking is a classic one. Uh, yeah, so I mean, banking, uh, lots of banks, uh, wealth management firms, uh, UK government, we've got some folks uh, at Engineer Better that have been in various different branches of UK government. Um, we've done work with security companies as well um, in the uh, kind of HSM space. They had some really interesting requirements. Um, so lots of folks regulated by the FSA, FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, the PCI DSS compliance as well, the credit cards. I see that being mentioned in the uh, chat. And then, of course, there's the American HIPAA um, regulations around uh, healthcare data. So we've worked with quite a few of those folks. And one thing that they all have in common, well, there's a couple of things they all have in common. There are the regulations which, if you go and read them, are quite reasonable. They don't say, thou shalt not use the cloud. They do say things that are reasonable and proportionate, and they're actually quite balanced when you go back and read them. They don't offer hard and fast rules about what you can and can't do. But to kind of um, extend on what Holly was describing, there are some folks whose job it is to interpret those regulations and transcribe them into policies. And one of the challenges we found time and time again uh, across various different sectors and various different types of regulation is that internal policies get confused with the regulations. And because somebody in a compliance department 10 years ago wrote a thing in a Word document, people take it as the gospel truth etched into a stone tablet that can't ever be uh, broken. And really, that's not the case. So one of the takeaways I'll give to anyone working in a regulated organization here is that you should challenge people to reinterpret regulations and not reapply policies, because it's much easier, just as Holly was describing, you know, for the people in those uh, positions to say no. You know, the safest thing for them to do is just say no. What's the most secure building? It's one with no windows and doors. Would you want to live there? Would it be much use to anyone? <laughs> not really. Um, 
and I was ranting on Twitter uh, in preparation for this about the, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was a like delivery or productivity regulation authority that you know, came and gave you a fine or retracted your ability to deploy code into live environments if you couldn't get into production within three days. Like there's a there's a lopsided set of uh, incentives um, in there. So the uh, I would say the reinterpretation of regulations is really key. And I, I mentioned that these folks often have something in, in common. They all think they're special. You talk to banks and it's like, can't use Slack, we'd lose our banking license. Really? Because I'm working with this other bank and they can use Slack. You talk to people in healthcare, it's like, oh, we can't do that, you know, we, we'd get fined. It's like, nah, I'm pretty sure that you can. Government, same thing. Everybody thinks they've got special problems that are totally unique. And really, they're not. It, it's very common stuff. And, and I think it becomes an excuse as well. So it, it becomes... Um an excuse for for the compliance team but then i think across the whole organization as well it sort of becomes this this pervasive thing so often when i talk about cloud native the first question i will get is oh but we can't exactly as you say oh we can't do that because we're regulated and it sort of becomes this mindset of we can't have anything nice we can't ever improve anything because we're regulated and it, it's just not true it just means that you know things maybe need to be approached in a slightly different way or a bit more integration across teams but it it can be done and part of yeah. that comes to uh, to to risk management you know the the it's harder and it's more work to go and look at the regulations and, what, and then come up with a different way of managing risk and for example let's talk about uh, se segregation of duties that's often highlighted as an absolute um, incontrovertible truth that you can't have the same people like writing code as deploying it. And that's for good reason, right? If you imagine the old world, certainly in my first job when I was a complete cowboy coder, um, compiling jars and then win SCPing them to a live production server back in the early noughties, I could have put any number of uh, kind of uh, backdoor hacks into that code, deployed it straight into prod, um, and that would have been a very bad thing. And so, you know, we have this idea that people that write the code should never deploy it, and they must be separate. We must have ops and uh, development completely separated. But if you instead assume that the only path to production is through automated systems, through audited version control, and no one else has the ability to even touch production, then you can come up with a different risk management answer there that isn't we have to have separate people doing these things, it's that we have to have maybe separate people building the CI pipeline that is the path to production, or that at least two people must have seen every line of code that gets into production. And we have policies in place to make sure that the only way into production is this kind of golden, uh, you know, automated path to prod. But that means that all the compliance people, instead of writing regulations based on what they learned at a course three years ago, they have to be aware with current technology. And the burden is on us as the technologists to explain to people, you know, what the benefits are here and how these systems work. And like, hey, you know, all those regulations you've got, we don't need those anymore. Like we can change uh, all those policies you've got. We can change those because everything is going to go through a durable, auditable uh, system before it gets into prod. No one's going to be able to just log in and change stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the, the, you've brought us neatly onto why why GitOps is particularly relevant for, for regulated industry, because a lot of these conversations go away. Um, but I have a little bit of an anecdote about, about dealing with auditors. Um, I once worked for, uh, as I mentioned, a gambling company. We had to demonstrate to um, escrow companies that we were able to build, rebuild the system in the event of a disaster. Um, uh, you know, the, demonstrate to them that we could rebuild the system in the event of a disaster. And uh, that process was done yearly, and it usually took, you know, two weeks for one engineer to kind of painstakingly try and build an environment and show them that they could do it and then slightly document it on a confluence page somewhere or something. And I was fiddling with Docker at the time, and I said, hey, I've, I've actually just packaged your our 15-year-old uh, monolithic three-tier architecture into one Docker image, and I have a reproducible build. And the, uh, the auditor looked at this and said, what's Docker? And uh, I explained what it was, and uh, he looked at it and, and said, "Yeah, that's fine, great, thanks." It was all over within a day, 
Um, so, the, you know, the, the process of automating these things can reduce your, your burden with um, these, these um, teams that otherwise, the teams and groups of people who otherwise might get in your way. So, so GitOps with its, um, you know, audited changes, uh, with its uh, zero touch live environments, um, with a record of everything in, in source, uh, including who did what, um, is it, very, very auditor friendly. And it was the reason I got really got interested in GitOps while I was working at, at a bank. Um, so, uh, yeah, a little bit about the history of GitOps. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, there's nothing uh, fully new about GitOps. It's, it's uh, the, the name for a collection of practices that came together. But, but where did it come from? So the name was coined by Weave in a, in a blog post in, I think, 2017. Um, and it's a collection of, of pre-existing practices. Um, but why did it come about at this time? Well, uh, DJ, do you, do you have a view on that? Or? Oh, I do. Um, but uh, I think there are, there are a combination of factors. One of them is clearly Kubernetes. So you could achieve the GitOps way of working with other technologies that were declarative and convergent. But Kubernetes kind of came along and got everybody very excited about um, declarative convergent systems. And I think that as soon as it became clear that Kubernetes was going to be the, the kind of layer of infrastructure upon which all future systems would be built, it became much easier to kind of um, rally people around that cause. Because we've been doing what is described as GitOps for years, kind of going back to 2016, um, you know, kind of fully automated pipelines to production in which all infrastructure is described in code and versions of everything are locked down and committed in code so it's fully reproducible. But having, but that was optional. You know, we could have done procedural imperative things in our pipelines and we could have totally, you know, uh, not followed GitOps. It becomes much easier when the substrate you're building your system upon is only declarative and uh, convergent or, you know, you have to work hard to break it. So I think the, the kind of advent of Kubernetes as a, um, uh, a, a new universal substrate definitely accelerated things. And then there's also maybe a, another angle there, and that's to do with maybe less Kubernetes itself, but the design patterns that it embodies and inspires, things like having controllers. And people were much more familiar then with control loops. Like we in the olden days, um, would be pipelining things using CI servers that were outside of a cluster. You know, they, they were affecting systems from the outside in, whereas it's uh, much more common, I gather, with um, Kubernetes-based workflows to have something running inside your cluster that pulls things in. There's possibly also another aspect that is related to that, and that is the decentralized nature of GitOps. So the kind of things that we were doing six years ago were building out entire environments. And you've got one monolithic pipeline that knows all the things that are going to be deployed into an environment and can show you the progress through that. And there are all sorts of benefits to doing that, but it becomes a point of coupling. Whereas if you're pulling things into a cluster, you can have lots of separate little control loops that looking after this microservice or that microservice or this database or you know that Redis cluster. And you don't have that uh, kind of tight coupling um, into a central pipeline, which probably made it easier for people to consume and digest. I have another theory about the why now as well. Um, which is I think sometimes these things happen because of a convergence of the technology and language patterns. So, you know, as Daniel said, you know, a lot of these things we've been doing for a long time and then the technology sort of inched towards becoming more and more declarative. But we've also been in the opsification of everything for a while. So first of all, we had DevOps and then we have had DevSecOps and then we had design ops and then we had FinOps and then we had chat ops. And so there's this sort of... Um, pattern that we're seeing of optifying everything and you know <laughs> we're sort of looking for these nouns that we can put in front of ops and as soon as we've this pattern sort of started to emerge and then we realized we could call it get ops and then that really sort of crystallized for a lot of us probably what we were sort of already doing and made the benefits really clear we went oh yeah let's do get ops 
that, yeah, that's that's a really interesting take on it. Um, I've never thought of it in that in that way. I love the idea of uh, adding nouns to ops in a kind of Germanic Germanic way uh, as well. That's that's really what we were doing for a long time uh, before well before GitOps. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, Kubernetes for me was the the big catalyst because it's so fundamental. It's the new it's basically a new API operating system. It's effectively some sort of distributed operating system with, with the Linux API underneath. Um, and so it permeates everything. The decisions they made around uh, the controller model using a declarative uh, means of, of specifying what you want. Um, these, these were, uh, I'm not sure they were actually set in stone. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe Google's internal Borg uh, used it use that okay dj's nodding so so they were doing that well before um but they could have gone a different route uh, it could have been another technology that did it in a different way um so so but but it, we, like, before we had kubernetes we also had terraform which was declarative which is declarative um and and so it's it's really interesting. And on, on the diagram there, I, I had a forehead slapping moment after I did the diagram, which I didn't actually put Kubernetes on there at all, which is crazy. Uh, um, but if you go back there, you see make right at the top being um, the, the kind of first declarative tool uh, in, in, in the history. Um, and then you and then Terraform follows it in 2014. Um, but, uh, uh, and by the way, Make is still, uh, I'm on a project now and they're, they're avid users of Make um, in order to improve DevX of all things. So uh, it's not gonna die anytime soon. But it was really interesting that this declarative uh, trend came along at, at that time. Um, so yeah, uh, we've had a question actually about um, Terraform versus Pulumi. I don't know if uh, Holly or DJ, you have an experience with Pulumi, but I've only ever used Terraform uh, on my projects. Same here. I've, I've been seeing more and more people getting excited about Plumi, and I keep going, mm, yes, yes, must must try that out, but not yet for me. We did a spike with it after I had a very nice conversation with the folks at the Plumi stand at KubeCon. Uh, really interesting chat with them. Um, and we did a bit of a spike. I think the danger comes in having too much imperative logic. Uh, and too much logic really in the deployment of your platforms it's a slippery slope right there's, there's a reason why uh terraform can be quite elegant um and even with terraform you can start getting yourself into trouble by trying to do things that are a bit too clever um so i haven't used it enough to have a very informed opinion and i certainly would encourage people to go and try it out you know see if it works for you um but i'm always slightly suspicious of uh things that could be used to make your uh, infrastructure deployment methods more imperative you know by which i mean like do this do that do the other and control flow loops and those sorts of things as opposed to purely declarative and letting the tool figure it out yeah and we're touching on something uh, that i found in a lot of gitops projects i've worked on which is that um one of the big challenges uh is uh getting people to to think in that different way about what they're doing and i think we had the same experience collectively as an industry with uh, configuration management tools um chef was was somewhat easier to grok for people because it had that um uh imperative kind of uh side to it as well as being an agent so it had the convergence but plus the imperative um side to it um and I've said, I found with Terraform that if someone has no experience and, and moreover, not a great interest in learning about Terraform, they really struggle with the non-imperative nature of it um, and just say, oh, I just want to do this if um, if my database lookup tells me that, that this particular uh, you know, variable is, is, is a certain thing and you kind of have to, you kind of have to educate them on, 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 on why it is the way it is. Um, is that something you've seen in projects? I mean, I, I think there's sort of two two parts to it. So you're right that there's definitely like you have to get your head around the declarative. But then one of the things that's making that harder for people is that with a lot of these tools, there's a golden path. And so if you're if you're doing something, you know, exactly in the way that you know there, there's the the providers, then you're good. 
but then as soon as you deviate off that golden path, then you're forced back into the imperative world. So even if you have the most declarative headspace, you're still doing cell scripts and that kind of thing. And, and that's one of the, um, I mean, this is a bit of a, a tangent, but on, on one of the projects that I was doing recently with Terraform, it did not work. Um, and the reason it didn't work was because we had to use the shell scripts and then the shell scripts had bugs. So there was things like a shell script failing and not returning an error code, it would just return zero. So then everything would proceed. So then at the end, even though we were sort of using Terraform, our intended state didn't actually match the, the actual state. So in that case, we, you know, in terms of the auditability, we, we did have a problem and we weren't really realizing the GitOps stream because we, we hadn't converged. Um, which, you know, it, it's one of those things that I think we sort of, we can fix that, but we need to be aware of that as a sort of a, a stumbling point on the, the route to get ops. I think, Holly, you've touched on a really important part there, which is that um, kind of relating back to what Ian was saying about some people are struggling to uh, move away from the imperative approach. And that is that in a declarative system, you yield control over what's going to happen in what order to a system that maybe is a black box to you. And so it can be hard to understand because like you don't see the order things are happening in. And whilst you're on that golden path that Holly described, everything is great. As soon as it, it uh, goes wrong, it's like, well, where do I debug? There's no sequence of steps for me to look through to figure out what it was trying to do. So it can be hard to understand, um, especially when things go wrong. Anyone that ever worked with Spring, uh, I'm sure will uh, be able to know that although jamie's probably the only person here that's been around long enough to be a spring developer anyway and me and him both you can see the gray hair here on me um the I'm older than, uh, dj i'm older than jamie so oh blimey uh, 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 never spring. um and the other part with the um sort of hidden imperative side like you know it's all imperative behind the scenes right so there will be a set of steps you won't know what that is until you test it and that is a key part of doing GitOps well is having test environments that look very much like your production environment because if you think about testing code you know, you want to make sure that all code paths are exercised that you know you've tested every if every for loop um, that could possibly be entered and those will be dependent on the state that you put in with a declarative convergent system the state that the thing is in and therefore the code path that is going to get exercised are, are kind of coupled, right? It's the state of the system when you apply it. So if you've got a prod system that looks nothing like your staging or your pre-prod environment, and then you tell Terraform to go do its thing, you won't have tested that behavior. That is completely untested. It might have worked in a previous environment that looked nothing like the prod one, but you've got to be testing uh, through a, a series of environments that that look ever more like your production one. Otherwise, who knows what might happen? You're kind of like leaving it in the hands of these uh, convergent tools to be able to find the right path to get to um, to you know live up to their uh, convergent declarative promise. And you've got to test it in dirty environments as well, because I think quite often in tests, we want our tests to be reproducible, of course. And so we say the way to make my test reproducible is to make my environment really clean and well controlled. And then, again, you know, you're sort of not necessarily testing the nasty things that will happen in prod. Yeah, and we, we got a question, I think, before the, uh, before the panel about um, how do you test changes to Terraform? And you know the the, the standard. Well, uh, uh, my standard answer to that is is you, as GJ said, is you have multiple environments that are are basically copies of, of each other, and you apply them one by one. Typically, we have what's called an or well, one one schema for this is a, an infra environment, which the infra team uses to test test their changes to infrastructure. And then you have your dev environment, which is where developers uh, throw their throw their their um, their stuff on and then you have a product environment which is obviously for production um and it's the dev environment that tends to get the most noise because uh production environments tend to be quite stable in a GitOps world because you you're by that point you're pretty sure of, of how things will behave from an infrastructure point of view but the development by the time it gets to the development environment you possibly only tested it in one prior safe environment uh, called infra also dev environments tend to be super busy 
Um, so, so yeah, so uh, this this whole thing of um, how you test it is is a is a very different mindset. And also, DJ, DJ uh, you you remind me that um, you're you're actually are testing code paths, but you have no idea which code paths because you have <laughs> to trust the controller to do its job properly. Um, and we haven't, I mean, I haven't had any problems with that so far. Um, but I imagine they could be. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, the um, uh, we have found this more from the kind of pipelining approach where we've used CI/CD systems with a pipeline, and then there's some sort of logic in there that's like, oh, this bit only applies to prod because we're not using a web application firewall in the pre-prod environments because it's too expensive. And you can be sure as damn it that like that's where the bugs will be. Um, and the same principle applies to things like Terraform or to Kubernetes controllers that, you know, if the state's different, the path through the code would be different. Therefore it's not tested. So trying to match those up as much as possible is um, a uh, very important thing to do. And we've had bugs creep in um, with the Argo config as well, which will it tend to not be source controlled because by definition it, it, it can't be, um, or at least not in, in the same mechanism. And so then we'll find that somehow some of our Argo was not looking at some of our files or it wasn't copying some of our files in one system. So then in the other systems, it was working great. And then in that one system, Argo wasn't applying things properly. And then we'd have to sort of go through and tear our hair out going, but why is in source control? Why doesn't it work? And, and I think Holly, you mentioned testing there. Um, uh so important um, and this kind of ties into principles like platform as a product that it's one thing if your job succeeds you know if, if your uh, job runs as an update and things go green and everyone's like yay it worked did it have the intended outcome and uh, we mentioned firewall changes in excel spreadsheets earlier and we need to have that kind of uh, double accounting type uh, standard for infrastructure like we do with software of we write the implementation, we write our declarative config saying what we want to happen. And there should be some sort of BDD style testing that says, as a hacker, I can't access this VM on port 22. And then you try connecting to it and then you get a, you know, uh, you get a connection refused, your test goes green. Those things um, should go hand in hand, I believe. Otherwise, you're just kind of checking that the tool works, but not that the outcome was the right outcome. Yes, that brings brings me really neatly on to something else I want to talk about, which is continuous compliance. Um, so uh, there's a tool called Inspec, which I absolutely love, and I do not understand why it has not taken over the world, because it's essentially a testing tool designed to keep uh, auditors and compliance officers happy. Um, and I've used it uh, in a couple of projects and, and been really impressed by it. But it basically does does what you say. DJ, I think you know you can check that the right ports are open and, and so on. Um, you can check all sorts of things using Inspect. Um, there's also uh, in the Kubernetes world, there's things like Starboard, which helps you with continuous uh, checking against CIS standards, uh, security standards in, in in Kubernetes, and that that kind of thing really keeps compliance uh, folks happy. Um, because of course, in the old, in the pre GitOps world, um, some someone from compliance would turn up and ask you to demonstrate all these things, and you'd have to scurry away for a few days and produce all sorts of ad hoc bits of evidence that you you're do, doing things in the right way. But if it's continuous, if it's part of your process, you just you just give them a printout if they if they want a printout or send them a file, and you're done. So um, it, the yeah, so the effort the effort spent on automating all that pays off uh, uh, every time you you have to. Um, uh, and of course, there's no rework. Of course, if you're if you're complying with the standard that's set, you can make that continuous, just like if you're running tests every time, and then you you don't have to do any rework uh, later on. Okay, um, I'm just going to look quickly look up at the, the questions. Uh, if we had any questions we haven't covered yet. Uh, yeah, we, we had a question about security. I think I think we've covered a little bit about that, but is there any particular light you want to throw on security and 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 GitOps? 
perhaps in the DevSecOps context? Um, I think there are a few general things to say, one of which is that by automating things, you get the opportunity to have, like say, automated compliance testing. Um, if you test for security and are running scans, like um, I mentioned the work that we did with Sneak, um, you know, they've got an IAC misconfiguration tool. Um, I think it, they generally prefer not to say like security scanning tool, um, but one that will check your Terraform and Cube YAML for, um, for miscon common misconfigurations that would let attackers do naughty things. So you have that kind of injection point to continually assert uh, that security is as it should be. Um, maybe related to security, maybe auditability. Um, and it's something that I wanted to try and, and drop in here in terms of tangible advice, uh, actionable advice for people. And that is verified commits. If you can uh, will yourself to go through the effort of uh, setting up GPG commit signing with Git, you can cryptographically prove that a commit was written by who it says it was. And that means that you, you know, can be really sure about code provenance. Mm -hmm. And that is a great thing to have to make sure that dodgy uh, backdoors don't get added into your code. So if you have your uh, pipelines and your GitOps operators checking that commits are signed before they're allowed to proceed, um, then you've got much stronger guarantees over the provenance of, of that code. I'm, I'm really curious now, DJ, have you been on a project that demanded that? Yes. Um, Yes, wow. I mean, so we, uh, it's the, one of the first things that we do with new hires is get them set up with that. So we kind of insist on it. Um, but um, uh, I think it's fair to say that the UK government um, insists on that and some uh, wealth management firms that we've worked with. Also, um, you couldn't emerge PRs um, with those folks unless uh, things were uh, verified commits. So cryptographically proven to be by that person. Is it, is it fair to say that the attack surface is smaller because we have one YAML file that covers all your infrastructure and not loads of random scripts all over different places where security issues or flaws may be exposed? Is that a fair like thing to say about GitOps and security? I think you get um, maybe less a smaller surface area, but uh, you get, uh, in, in military terms, a choke point. You know, of everything has to go through this one very narrow point that's easier to defend and then back out again. And if you make the only path to prod um, through that automated um, choke point, then there are far fewer people that need credentials. And the, the aspiration is that no one has prod credentials until they hit the break glass button. And then there's some automated process to generate some short-lived credentials with God mode access. Um, to and prod. Surely, surely, if you're, auto, if you're scanning your, the, the build file, surely if there's one file, it's easier to scan, right? So it's, it, it, are there any tools that automate the scanning of GitOps pipelines to look for security holes? The, I'm pretty sure that sneak one does um off the top of my head we talked about Anybody it in terms of sneak on the call that would like to explain no free marketing you see they're, they're, they're in the wrong <laughs> place at the wrong time uh, someone mentioned there's a tool called Chekhov that scans terraform files i think i have come across that briefly in the past but i mean the, the attack surfaces are always very wide uh you know this it's the biggest danger is, is some external image that has some some, some back door on it or, you know, there's all sorts of ways people can break the system. But I think uh, DJ's point about choke points is really key. You, because you have this smaller point, you, could, you can reason about things much, much better. And also because uh, access to live environments is not routine, um, not to say that it never happens, but it's not routine. Um, you can say that generally speaking, unless the following things happen, uh, we know that no human tampered with this. Um, no, in a in a informal sense, not a formal sense. Um, so you could still have a break glass procedure, and there are often break glass procedures still in place in GitOps environments because uh, in 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 extremists, people still need to go on and look at look at what's going on in the live system. But it's far far rarer and far far easier to manage from a compliance point of view because you can say you know the following people signed. The three events this year when when we had to go to production 
there's another security aspect um, in all of this that it becomes much easier to implement the three R's of security. So rotate, repair, repave when you've got a GitOps workflow that is, um, you know, kind of declaratively uh, describing the infrastructure you've got. So, you know, rotating credentials, if everything's automated and defined in code, you know, why would you have hard coded credentials? I mean, you just wouldn't. Right, first and foremost so it kind of becomes a forcing function for that uh repairing so being able to apply patches if you've got all of your infrastructure and this goes as far as you know um kind of the microservice code that you've got that gets baked into an image if that's all um automated then you can use things like Dependabot and the other tools that are available to automatically bump dependencies in your apps and have those flow through the pipeline so it becomes uh, much quicker to patch cves <clears throat> log for j um and also repaving. So being able to tear down systems and then recreate them. Combine that with your chaos testing to make sure that everything gets um, shot in the head. I'm trying to think of a uh, uh, less uh, violent way to describe that. But if every bit of infrastructure gets torn down regularly and gets recreated, then anything that um, does manage to sneak into your estate has a limited amount of time to exfiltrate data or to open up uh, vulnerabilities. So all of those practices kind of become much easier um, when you're adopting a, a GitOps workflow, if not, you know, are forced by it. Yeah, I think the, the secondary benefits of GitOps are enormous. Um, the ability to, to spin up, stamp out environments um or even users or anything because you've got it as code you can you can stamp it out more easily um that brings me on to another subject i want to talk about which is on the subject of actually implementing this because i think i think there is a it's very easy for people to agree with the principles uh you put it on a on a, on a powerpoint and everyone nods their head and goes that sounds really sensible um but when you when you go and try and implement it in organizations i think it's really interesting how difficult that can be. Um, Holly, you're nodding. Yeah, so, you know, as with anything, you've got the technology side, which is hard, and the people side, which is even harder. And, and, and you know, we talked earlier about those compliance teams and how do we, how do we bring them along with us? And how do we make them appreciate, not just on the PowerPoint, but then in, in the reality, this is gonna make their lives easier. Yeah. Um, and. One of the things that, that makes it difficult to actually implement GitOps, I find in the real world, is, is how front loaded it is. And this isn't a new thing because you see it with, with testing and, and any, any kind of automation. It's very expensive before you see the benefit. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've seen this on, on multiple projects that, that it can be a long time before you actually get to something in production. Um, or even something in development that, that that looks right because you have to make so many decisions about you know we're going to use which tool are we going to use to deploy are we going to use argo cd customize are we going to apply it direct are we going to use flux are we going to um you know there are all these decisions you have to make and not just about that about how are we going to represent an environment is it going to be a separate folder is it going to be a separate repository is it going to be a separate branch um these are all things that take a long time to 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 figure out, not because they're conceptually possible, but because you have to get everyone working on these projects on the same page, on the same understanding what's going on, and that can take time as well. It's certainly easier on greenfield uh, greenfield projects. Um, if you're trying to backport these kind of practices into an existing environment, that will be slow. It will be worth it, but it will be slow because there'll be lots of things to change. You end up in this halfway house where you know half the stuff's deployed this way and these two things deployed a new way and there's twice the operational overhead. I would say that there is a... Um, it, it can be easy in that doing the simplest thing that works and taking a thin slice of value, especially with a greenfield project of like, you can defer a lot of those situations, uh, a lot of those decisions by just doing the simplest thing that works right here and right now, and then adding in the complexity later. And if you've got a team that is able to move quickly because it doesn't have all of these kind of legacy slow processes, then it becomes safer to defer, uh, defer those decisions because if you realize that you know the structure's wrong or you know you're using branches and you'd rather do trunk based development or something you can make those changes uh, more quickly if you're in the sort of environment that isn't able to make changes quickly um, then you definitely yeah have to um, front load a lot more of that 
Yeah, so so my my uh, I, I I don't get to work on greenfield uh, projects very much. Maybe I should switch companies, DJ. Uh, but um, I found that that one of the, my top tip for this is to first get a measure of how, how long it takes to deploy, say, a color change to a, to a website. Um, you know, you changed a RGB code. How long will it take you to get that to production? So you've got to go through QA, you've got to go through testing, you've got to go through whatever. Does that take you two weeks? Can you can you put a number on it? And it doesn't have to be super scientific, but if you can get a number on that, you can say, yeah, it's taken us six months to build this GitOps beer moth um, thing. But now every time you release something, it takes two hours rather than two weeks and costs you know ten thousand pounds in 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 people time. And that's absolutely. Can- yeah. The, um, the importance of that, and that I think speaks to Holly's point about winning hearts and minds as well, in that measure, 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 like the number of customers we go to and they're like, oh, it takes ages to deploy stuff. And it's like, have you measured it? No. Okay, right. Measuring that um, is both useful for insight. And so you can be intentional about making improvements and being guided by science rather than uh, dogma. But once you have those figures like you describe Ian, then you can um, convince people by showing them the upsides of that of like look how much time we're saving look how much less exposure we now have to cves because our path to production is so much quicker um, being able to make the argument to stakeholders that's like we're going to save a lot of toil by doing this we're going to inc- uh, improve our lead time to production and reduce exposure to cves those are the sorts of things that people uh you know, stakeholders and managers and things will respond to. So taking those measurements, absolutely key. And uh, I might drop a link in the chats. Um, I gave a talk about kind of an entry level guide to value stream mapping, but like look at all the steps between here and production. How long do you spend working on a thing? How long does it spend waking, waiting before the next step goes through? And you can do that in half an hour on, on you know, on, on a whiteboard or whatever with your colleagues. And it might not be super precise, but it's certainly useful. And then that can start uh, a conversation. So anyone can do that. And I would highly recommend that you do if you haven't uh, ever t- tried that exercise. Absolutely. It's uh, it's a very powerful um, thing. And it's, it's something that is not always recognized by senior leaders. They don't actually know what's going on um, downstream. And they're, they're frankly not very interested. So if you give them a number, you know, it's twenty thousand pounds to do one trivial change, uh, or something like that, then then they can start to reason about it with with simple graphs that that show how much uh, how GitOps will pay off over time, um, which can really help with with keeping keeping leaders on board. Um, so we had some questions before the uh, before the, before the call. So. Uh, there was one uh, I'd like to cover them. So, so this one is true fully automated CD, uh, which I think is continuous delivery, but could be continuous. De- uh, I think it's continuous deployment, but could be continuous delivery. Is it pie in the sky for regulated industries? How do we overcome the approval required aspect in terms of people versus machines? So, continuous delivery does not require that you're continuously delivering to production. Continuous delivery, as described in the book of 2010, um, which many more people should read, um, talks about getting things into an acceptance environment so the stakeholder who asks for the work can check that it is the right thing and it does work okay. And then the deployments might be batched up. So continuous delivery, yes, you can absolutely do that in a regulated environment. We have many times with many customers. Continuous deployment then becomes um, a bit more tricky. And then you need to look at the um, policies that are informed by regulations of, do we need manual approval? Or is the approval the test suite? You know, is the approval that um, someone would get, I mean, what's a human going to do when they say, yes, this is good to go to prod? You know, I've worked in places and they're like, oh, well, every code change needs to be seen by two separate security people before it can go into prod. I'm like, okay, you want that? You're going to get it. You'll get an email every time our CI pipeline fires. Three days later, they back down on that proposal. Um, but what's a human going to do? You know, read the code a bit, um, maybe run some manual tests. Those are no substitutes for an automated test suite and a full-on code review, which could be, you know, made auditable through Git history. And so 
is the approval actually that somebody else or some blessed person has said this test suite adequately covers everything that we're interested in in which case happy times you know the, then you can go through all the way to production but that does mean a shift in the thinking of the people doing the risk management and the compliance and governance and that's where the the tricky part lies um, because they're probably not as familiar with these practices so making the case of why uh, this is an acceptable way of working um, and talking about small batches of change and the uh, reduced risk therein um, those are things that you'll need to do in order to be able to achieve continuous deployment and then there's a whole load of extra kind of concerns about being able to roll back and having the observability. Continuous deployment is a significant step ahead in terms of the number of things that you need to think about and be prepared for. I would argue that it's worth it, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a big undertaking. And in terms of the regulations, there's always going to be some automation before the manual approval, and there's always going to be some automation after the manual approval, unless you're, you know, you're sort of carrying the bits one by one to the prod machine. So it's about accepting that the automation is going to be there. It just may be a slightly different automation than we were used to 10 years ago. That's a good thing. And then on that manual approval, trying to get the cost as low as possible. So ideally, if, if we need the manual approval, it's just a one click thing that then goes. If we need to have a bunch of paperwork in place, audit trails in place, then let's automatically prepare the package for the approver so that they can look at it and say, okay, here's this test suite report. Here's the report of the, the Git commits. I can see it's all good, click button. Yeah, and I think, I mean, from my perspective, DJ, having worked in, in banking, there is this ludicrous requirement that a, an MD has to have signed off for a, a change. And the purpose is not that the MD has understood all the test cases and all the ramifications, but it's more that they uh, their name is on it. They want a, a throat choke. And they have to have had the opportunity to, to go and quiz people around them before they sign it off. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's true continuous uh, deployment where where there is no uh, choke point. Um, it's, it's still relatively choke rare. I, I, I have never seen it. I've never seen fully automated re released. I know it exists, but I've never seen it in, in practice. I've always seen there be at least one or two points along the way where it, the, 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 the system stops and waits for something to happen. I'm just looking back at a Slack conversation I was having with some of my uh, folks who'd worked in government, and I'm fairly sure some of those systems are continuous deployment, um, and fairly important ones as well, um, involving things like payments and, say, sending people text messages to let them know they've got COVID, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but the uh, GDS folks, Government Digital Service, are very open, and uh, if you can track them down on Twitter, I'm sure they'll be willing to uh, tell you more. Yeah, and I, I do tell a bit of a lie, actually, because um, at one bank I worked at, uh, we managed to hack. We were parasitic on the process. There was a thing called an automated change approval process, uh, which was a thing in service now that didn't require any approvals because it was a routine change. And we got application rollouts um, under that rubric. So, in fact, the application rollout could be fully automated and it would create a service now ticket and then automatically approve these things um, wasn't an easy process to get that in place, but uh, you can do all sorts of, uh, you know, clever trickery with, with bureaucratic processes if you really understand them. Unfortunately, they're generally only understood by people who work 15 years or something, and uh, you have to catch them at the right point at the coffee machine to, to know where the hacks are, but um, they do exist. Um, so I'm just looking at some of the uh, other questions. I think some of them we've, we've covered, but uh, there was one about how do we go about bringing on board compliance folks who are used to SOPs, which I assume is standard operating procedures, sign off on gates. Um, and I think, uh, DJ, you had a view that that was... <laughs> that um, was yeah. So one of, one of the bits, uh, comments I had from one of my folks was a global pandemic that tends to sharpen focus on um, what we need to get done. Um, say, if you were working in a government and all of a sudden you had to make changes to your website pretty quickly, um, then 
and pretty regularly as well, then uh, folks tend to uh, listen a little bit more about automated processes and uh, approval and so on and so forth. Um, so that would be one way of uh, doing that. Not, not necessarily uh, an easy thing to orchestrate, um, but getting people on board, I, th I think some of the things we've already mentioned, you know, explaining the benefits, explaining the fact this is a fully audited system, because most people probably think like it's still the Wild West and, you know, Rachel can just SSH into some server and, you know, make a config change on a, a prod box. Um, so explain to them how the system works, how everything is audited, how uh, access is restricted will definitely uh, help asking people to go back to the regulations rather than their policies and doing so in you know an empathetic way um, will definitely help all the things we've mentioned about being able to measure things um, will certainly help um, i think all of those things combined um, should help get people on board and if they don't mm, then i suppose it's time to escalate and maybe ask for a new compliance or security person but um, I, I think most people would be receptive if information has been presented to them in, um, you know, the the right fashion, and like like we've kind of mentioned, I think Ian, you were saying, you know, the auditability of this is really great for compliance folks. They love it. And I think that that empathy is so so important, and and because I think you know sometimes, I mean, I I, I sort of hinted at this a bit in some of the things I've said. You know, we have this attitude of we're doing great things, we're trying to make the business better, and they're getting in our way, and they're inflexible, and they're, you know, ignorant of, and, and, you know, I think we have to sort of step past that and say, well, actually, they're doing a really difficult and skilled job. They have a whole bunch of knowledge that we don't have. Let's, I mean, obviously, we can't completely get there, but let's, let's make an effort to speak their language. Let's make an effort to understand their incentives, understand their world, and then talk to them in in their language and and once we get over that what we're trying to do is actually going to make things better for them it's going to make it more secure more auditable so if we can get into that place where we're communicating in the same terms then hopefully that helps a lot and understand their concerns as well right because you know <laughs> their their concern is i need to protect this business from getting in a lot of legal hot water that's an important concern of course they care about it yeah, there's actually um, there's a really good book, uh, which I'll send a link around uh, called The Delicate Art of Bureaucracy um, by a guy, a chap called Mark Schwartz, who's written, uh, I recommend you read all his books because they're all fantastic and really thoughtful and insightful. Um, he actually works now at AWS, but formerly worked uh, in uh, immigration, the immigration department of the US government. So you can imagine there was a little bit of bureaucracy around those processes. And he talks about how, how to hack these things. And one of the things he does talk about is uh, if you can develop the right relationships with these people, um, then you can actually achieve a hell of a lot more. Um, so yeah, I really recommend that book to anyone who, who's dealing with bureaucracy because it's a really practical, real world uh, reflection on you know, how to not, not, not bash your head against a brick wall and Ian, isn't it true that Mark is going to come on as a guest very shortly on the, on the, one of these what the fuck it has? Yes, we did a we did a, a panel with him last year, um, which I chaired as well on on uh, why is why is why is cloud native so slow? Why is it uh, going so slow? Um, which I think we can get a link to people here on, and he will be on a a, a webinar later this year. And he's 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 very funny, charming guy, uh, well worth a listen to. Um, okay. Uh, is there anything else we want to cover, or is there anything else, any Q and A that, that people would like to? There was a question from um, from David Paisley in the chat that I don't think we've fully addressed, and I think actually it's one that's sort of um, good for um, not just us three, but you know everybody to sort of give their their take on it of of you know whether because he was asking about whether what he was doing was a common practice. Yeah, I, I saw it and I couldn't fully pause it. Well, <laughs> yeah, can I actually speak? <laughs> can folks hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So basically, you know, we do QA and we run a lot of images through QA. We, we look at them and we find a problem and we build it again and we run it through again. 
and they change very rapidly, you know, tens of times a day, certainly hundreds sometimes. And so it, it seemed like it was a bit much to do formal GitOp updates for every QA change that was never destined for production. So we started just updating the Argo CD definition directly. I'm um, saying, all right, I want to see this now with this image SHA. And we just wrote, we just flip the, those and don't do formal git ops for QA. And only when we're ready to take a batch that, of QA um, stories, do we then commit those image builds, check those final images, and then shove and then, you know, get get ops those through the chain to production so so i felt kind of bad when i stopped committing all those changes to to get every time we tried a new set of images in qa and i'm just wondering if anybody else is doing that sort of thing where they just skip uh commits for every single qa check what when you say qa check what kind of qa are you thinking so, uh, you know, front end developer um, is updating, uh, you know, an interface to some view of data. Our QA person goes through and says, oh, when I do this, it looks, it looks wrong. And so the front end developer goes, oh, sorry, let me fix that. And they go in and make another change. They rebuild the image and they push the new image out. And, you know, we can, you know, for a single story, we can cycle through that, you know, dozens of times where our QA person who's used to dickering with the interface and breaking it, is finding issues that we didn't know we had. So, so instead of you know going to GitOps and saying, okay, the image shot for the front end now is X, um, instead we're just updating the Argo CD uh, definition and saying, okay, let's look at this one now. Let's look at this one now. Does that help? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to hear other people's uh, take on this. I would say that maybe there's a broader kind of uh, thing there of having QA after the commit. And if you can pull that, I mean, obviously it'll be a big organizational change, but it's a conversation we have a lot in kind of uh, transformative consultations about quality being a uh, product feature and anything that the QAs might spot or might not like, or might go, hey, can you do that differently? Or it's not quite right. Should have been specified before the developer got their hands on it and then an automated test written around it. And then you, you reduce some of that cycle time. Um, and it, it sounds like maybe the, um, the, you know, the pollution of Git history with loads of shards going through is actually a symptom rather than the cause. Although on the other hand, I, th I think there is, you know, <laughs> it sounds like you're doing small commits, which is, is a good thing. And so some of the reason that you're seeing such a sort of a volume going through is because the commits are small, which is, probably a good thing rather than getting it sort of because I think you're, you're right that you know you're you're going to want to well it, it's not unreasonable to batch before production but it, I think it's good that you're not batching right at the beginning and you know you have the developer sat at their desk for two weeks going well here's my two weeks worth of git changes into the system yeah I, I wouldn't regard what you're doing as a violation uh, <laughs> uh, worth uh, thank you worrying about. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think I think in dev we've done things where we just use latest and we uh, refresh things or have an auto refresh on Argo CD to pick to pick up the change. Um, what you do touch on something or, or your your comment um, raises something, which is that that people get very frustrated, especially if they're they're new to GitOps, by the fact that they can't just make a change directly on the system. Um, and, and it, it seems so much easier for them, them to just dive on to the, the box and, and make a change. And you have to say, no, you have to wait for the, the CI to run and, and for it to pick it up and so on. And so optimizing your, your pipeline um, so that it doesn't take too long becomes a critical part of, of the kind of hygiene of your team. There's, those aren't mutually exclusive though. The, the manually logging in and fiddling with a thing, especially when there's a production outage. Like sometimes, like we're losing tens of thousands of dollars a minute, we need to go in and fix this thing. We can't wait for the pipeline. Um, that's perfectly fine. And similarly with kind of, you know, something's broken in dev, like by all means, log in, change a thing, fiddle with it a bit, but just make sure that you have really strong discipline that whatever you do gets backported. Um, and that environments, you know, get blatted and recreated and those sorts of things. So that any uh, ephemeral changes are, are exactly that. Um, so 
you wouldn't want to only be making changes on live things um, or running systems and you ideally want to drive everything through git but you could make things um uh, to, to ian's point you could make changes and then backport them you just have to you know ha have some discipline <laughs> which is easier said than done yeah, and I suppose you know if I, if I'm being strict about it, DJ, that that's that's the same as the Excel spreadsheet thing, right? If everyone did their job perfectly, then the, the Excel spreadsheet would reflect the reality. Um, but unfortunately, people forget. I've I used to work on systems that were burning money, and I had to fix them right there and then by changing hacking code online and restarting app servers. And it did happen when I was so busy, I would just forget to make a change, or other people would. Um, so yeah, anything, anything which relies on the manual process is a bad smell and something that I worry about and I'm sure you do too. Um, but yeah, it, uh, the, the point I want to make is that you do sometimes have to sacrifice things if it makes the developer experience so bad that they can't be productive, then you have to actually think about the trade-off and usually then you, know, you need to think about, well, why is it so slow and why is it so difficult to do it this way? And, and that, that can lead you to, 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 to further improvements rather than just, just hacking away at it. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, I don't like to be uh, dogmatic about, about these rules because every situation is different and it's really about sensibly applying them rather than being pure. One of the things early on, somebody asked, is it pie in the sky in regulated industries? I wonder if it's the opposite based on what Daniel said about automation. Container Solutions right now is so heavily involved in many regulated industries or in systems that really produce tons and tons of revenue. And actually, GitOps and high automation are where, is working for all of our customers. And once they grok it, once they grok the mindset, there's no, there's no real going back. Uh, so I wonder if, in fact, it's not, the, it's not pie in the sky, but it's becoming the new norm. Yeah, I, th I think that that's true. It's, it's almost like when you reach the critical mass, the ball just flies down the hill um, to mix metaphors horribly. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, logically, it makes more sense to do it this way in a regulated industry. Um, uh, I th there, there, there is a gap in terms of knowledge and experience. This is going to sound really weird, but many years ago, and I'm talking probably... 14, 15 years ago. So can I do a Java tangent? I'm allowed to do a Java. Here we go. I, I, know, I know Holly knows something about Java for sure. And so Daniel, first thing, we don't use the S word at Container Solutions. Uh, so we were editing that from the video this spring. We don't, <laughs> we don't say that word, okay. But about 15 years ago, I was, I was CTO with my first executive position, but actually looking back, I was just a glorified engineer and you know I, I had a few reports into me and we were using xp i mean i was an old extreme programmer i loved that uh, and i was part of that movement and we had a lot of tests for a system we we're building some of them were testing calculations so floating point variations um and some of it was just testing you know scripts and we started to use fitness and fit tables and everybody said this is all this won't work the regular uh, you know we reject this we worked it was a a pension fund I liked that. And the regulator came and we showed them and they were like, this is awesome. So this bit that shows your system does this and this bit that shows your system do that. If you can do that in these table things you've got, we'll sign that off. And everybody in the company was flabbergasted. And I didn't know anything about regulations at the time. So I just thought, oh, well, this is just, this is just what you do. I'm trying to decouple test logic from the test data so that our users can test and that was a real eye opener. And then all of a sudden, uh, it was like, oh, to hell with writing things down. Let's use uh, fitness and have a wiki page with with runnable tests in it. And that was that was really really cool. The end Java segue. I think I think uh, it, uh, this is one of the challenges we get when we we implement GitOps in, in companies, and it's not talked about enough, which is the the knowledge and, and skills gap. But for, for many for many people coming across these things, so they're not they're not necessarily interested in becoming Git experts or or um, or Kubernetes experts or or whatever, and and so working around that or or helping them grow is a is a huge part of the the, the, the challenge in 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 getting this into companies, um, because 
uh, it may make perfect sense, but they know how to do it the old fashioned way with the Excel spreadsheet and then logging onto the router and it's, it's, a, it's a complete mindset shift. Yeah, and that kind of thing needs to be done carefully, any kind of transformation. You need to give people the confidence that they can do it the new way before you tell them that the old way is discontinued. And Jamie mentioned, um, you know, extreme programming and uh, a fundamental part of that is pair programming. And that's one of the things we do quite a lot of is sitting down with teams and working with them, pairing with them to show them the new ways of doing it. So then when, by the time that we go, they already know everything that we know and we can leave and they can run it themselves. And making sure that people have those skills um, before kind of going, oh, we're going to do GitOps. It's like, this team is going to try doing GitOps for, you know, three months. And if it works, we'll roll it out further and making sure that those people, you know, are supported along the way. That uh, tends to be a much better way of affecting transformation. Than well, I mean, one of the rules we've got now, Daniel, is all, all transforming companies are training companies in a way. And so training is such a huge part of what we do. So you can literally spend six months fucking around with Kubernetes, GitOps, and, and asking what the cloud is. Or you could literally do two days of GitOps training, a Kubernetes bootcamp, and then by the end of that, have a language that you can speak about more practically. So we're not a training company, Container Solutions, but we found ourselves doing more and more training in order to unstick the, the work we're doing. I, I reminded Jamie of the CEO, uh, the Andy Grove quote, um, so he was CEO of Intel, and he said the most high value thing you can do as a leader or manager is teach. And I often say to people, like, what I actually do is, is train, you know, train through pairing and, and, and through working with people through these things and just saving their time in, yeah. in developing these skills. Yeah. So th exactly. This is what it's like being a chief executive. Your, your team come up to you with a book and say, this is what a good CEO does. That's what you were trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Holly? Have you seen anything about training and, and in your work or your coming at it from your angle? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, exactly the same as DJ. What we find most effective is is, is sort of that that bottom up and that pairing. And then, you know, if we sit with them, and because it it because one of the things that we find as well is I think you know as consultants we can sort of come in and go oh let me fix all your problems and we realize we only you know knew about ten percent of the problems and there was all of this other knowledge that they had and so making sure that the the training is a two-way training. So it's not just us coming in and saying, here is the new way, but that they, you know, they show us their world, they show us their skills, they show us their domain knowledge. And then that means that the, the outcome of the engagement is going to be better. We're going to learn something that's hopefully interesting. And then, you know, they, they learn in a way that doesn't feel talked down to because, because we're doing it side by side. And hopefully it's a lot stickier as well than a classroom session. That's a great, great thought to end on. Holly, because um, uh, we've run out of time. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming and, and all your involvement. It was a really, really great session. I really enjoyed it. I learned, I learned a lot. Um, thank you so much. If you want to reach out to us, please do. Uh, if, you, if anything you, we've discussed triggers, triggers any thoughts, you can contact me on Twitter or, or just email me or whatever. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, uh, for engaging so well. Thank you, Holly and DJ and Jamie. For, um, for all your contributions. That was really, really wonderful stuff. Um, thank you. And hopefully see you next time at the next web, uh, what the fuck, you know, maybe the Mark Schwartz one. Thank you, Ian, as well. Cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Nice to see you. Thank you, Ian, great facilitation. And thanks everybody for the great questions. Yeah. Bye-bye.